All right, so 2 Peter chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. Okay, here we go. We're going to talk about this morning how to stay on track spiritually. That's an important topic because it seems to me as a pastor that's been pastoring now for 30 some years, I've seen a lot of people will start out spiritually strong. A lot of people, will, they'll, they'll get out of the gate sprinting. They'll be on fire for Christ. And then the days and the weeks and the months and the years go by, and they get off track spiritually. And I've not only seen that with Christians in my ministry of the church, but I've seen that with pastors. I've seen pastors that are on fire for Christ, and they get derailed, and they get, don't stay on track spiritually, and they're not even in the ministry anymore. Breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart too when I see people that at one time are walking on fire for Christ and now they're just derailed. So we're going to look at this morning, we're going to look at how to not do that. I'm going to give you four principles this morning from Peter, the Apostle Peter, on how to stay on track spiritually. You know, the Apostle John wrote this in his uh, third epistle. He talked about uh, as, a, as his heart as a pastor. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That's a pastor's heart. What gives a pastor joy is to see everybody standing on track spiritually and walking in the truth. And my heart for myself and for you all is let's be like Paul that says, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've what? Kept the faith. Let's be people that aren't just sprinting out of the gate and then not going for the long haul with Jesus Christ. Let's be people that can say at the end of our lives with Apostle Paul, man, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And Peter's going to give us some tools this morning that will help us do that. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. We left off at verse 12 last week, and it says this. Verse 12, therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them, Christians, you already know them, but you've been established in the truth which is present with you. And I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you'll be able to call these things to mind. Now, first thing Peter's saying is, is I want to remind you of these things because I know my imminent departure it's, it's right on the corner. Remember, Jesus told Peter back in John, John chapter 21, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, Peter, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying Peter's death, what kind of death he would glorify God with. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. See what Jesus was doing there? He was telling Peter that around the corner, after your ministry's through, you're going to die a death, and it was a martyr's death. We know that's true from church history. He died being crucified upside down in Rome shortly after he wrote this epistle. So he said, with this in mind, my imminent departure is right around the corner. He was reading the writing on the wall. He was seeing that he was about to be martyred. And he said, with, with this imminent death around the corner, I want to do this. First of all, Christians, I want to remind you of some things. I want, to, I want to stir you up with some reminders of truth. And I want to make sure you're established in these truths. Now, that's the first thing I want you to see. If you want to be a Christian that's going to go the long haul, if you want to be a Christian that's going to keep on track spiritually, you got to be putting yourself in places where you're reminded of truths and you're established in truths on a regular basis. Why? Because repetition is one of the greatest forms of teaching and learning. And as you get repeatedly taught the same truths over and over and over again, those truths are going to go to the core of your being, and it's going to help you live it out. It's, it's, it's so important that we just don't hear one truth and then we pass up. No, we need to be established in the same truths over and over and over again. It's so important. You know, um, I've read through the Bible now, Genesis to Revelation, probably at least, at least 10 to 12 times. I, I make it a habit every year to read the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation. I read some Old Testament, Old Testament every morning, some New Testament, then every night, Old Testament, New Testament. I read about four chapters a, a day, two chapters a morning, two chapters a night. And you say, well, why you, tw 10 or 12 times with the whole Bible, why do you do that? Why don't you, get, why don't you have some, well, because 
I need to be reminded over and over again of the truths that I read as I read through Genesis to Revelation. And as I read through Genesis to Revelation, God's word is living and active. It, be- it becomes alive to me, and as I'm reminded of truths, like that God loves me. He loves a knucklehead like me. He loves me. And as I read these truths over and over again from Genesis to Revelation, it goes to the core of my being and helps me live out this Christian life. As I'm reading these truths, Genesis to Revelation, every year I read about how God forgives me. He forgives me not of some of my sins, but of all of my sins. The blood of Jesus cleanses me from all of my sins. And I see that from Genesis to Revelation, I'm forgiven by God. And that truth, to, it, I need to have that truth reminded over and over and over again. Because you know what? I sin and I make mistakes. And the devil's an accuser of the brethren. And he wants to condemn me. But then I read things like Romans 8.1 that says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And as far as the east is from the west, so God has removed my sins from me. And I'm reminded of those truths as I read over and over again of God's forgiveness from Genesis to Revelation. It's wonderful. And then I'm reminded, too, of the fact, as I read Genesis to Revelation, I'm reminded of the fact that, that, that not only does God forgive me, but I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm chosen by him. I'm, I'm, I'm adopted into his family, man. I have his spirit bearing witness to my spirit. I'm a child of God, and I can cry out to God, Abba, Father. And it's wonderful. I'm reminded from Genesis to Revelation of my status with God. I'm a child of God, and I'm reminded of truths like that, of, of my eternal status, too, that not only am I a child of God, I'm a joint heir with Christ, and one day I'm going to a place called paradise, and this is as bad as it's going to get, because Christ in me, it's the hope of glory. And I need to be, when, when we have battles like we've been having in our culture, like coronaviruses and all this other craziness, I remember this is only a little speck on the time span of eternity, and the truth helps me stay on track that soon and very soon I'm going to see Jesus Christ, and when I see him, I'm going to be like him, and my, my rest of eternity is going to be in a place where there's no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, no more sin, no more coronavirus, no more all this craziness, so it's going to be paradise. And as I study these things, and I'm reminded of these things, it helps me stay on track spiritually. It helps you stay on track spiritually, too. You know, we've, we've been, in this church in the last 23 years, we've been through the entire New Testament on Sunday mornings. Uh, we're on our fourth journey right now. We're going through, we'll be in the book of Revelation by next month. It'll be our fourth time through the New Testament, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Well, why don't we just change it up a little bit and do something different? Why don't we do just a topical series or something for a while? No, no, no. I want you to be in the book, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, as we go through the New Testament, because I want to, I want to be a pastor that's declaring to you the whole counsel of God, so you get all the truths that are in this book, and it, 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 it's repetitive. I know, we've gone, this is our fourth time through, but listen, every time we go through it, God will remind you of things that you need to be reminded of, and the Spirit will speak in fresh and new ways, because this book is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Amen? And so we're going to do this. You're going to be reminded of truths over and over again as we go through this book, but we need that. Because that's a part of staying on track spiritually, is to be reminded of the truths of God's forgiveness, God's love, God's salvation, God's future for you as we go through this book. It's wonderful. You know, there was a, there was a, there was a label for Christians for a while that people try to have like a negative label on Christians, calling Christians that were Bible-believing, born-again Christians, oh, those are, the, those are the fundamentalists. And they were trying to basically smear Christians that were just Bible-believing and born-again and conservative, although they're fundamentalists. I didn't take that as an insult at all. You know, fundamentals are a part of being successful in any area of life. If you want to be successful in any area of life, you've got to stick with the fundamentals. And as you stick with the fundamentals and you go through those fundamentals over and over again, what happens is you become successful in those areas. I remember uh, early on when we first started the church, I went with uh, our head usher, Wayne Coker, to a Lexington Medical Center fundraiser. And I don't usually go to fundraisers like that, but my favorite quarterback of all time was the speaker for this fundraiser, Joe Montana from the San Francisco 49ers. 
And so when I went, and I was just all years listening to this guy, because I think he was probably the greatest quarterback that ever played football. Well, Tom Brady's got more Super Bowls now, but still, I'm, I'm a Joe Montana fan. And Joe Montana won four Super Bowls. And if you look at those four Super Bowls that he won, a lot of the reason why they won those Super Bowls is because his incredible ability to, be, to, to drive the team down the field with his quarterbacking. And so it's all ears. How did this guy get so good at quarterbacking? You know what he to- told us during the uh, speech he gave at the Lexington Medical f- Fundraiser? He said that, that he would, every day in high school football practice, he would have a three or four hour practice. And then after the three or four hour practice, he would come home and his dad was waiting for him in their backyard of where he lived. And his dad had this uh, big tire rope swing on the back of their tree, on their tree in the backyard. And his dad would be ready for him and an hour every day after a three hour practice, every day, his dad would be swinging this rope swing back and forth with the, with the tire. And he said, okay, son, we're gonna do this for an hour. And as that tire was going back and forth, he had to throw the ball through the swinging tire for an hour. Bam, 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 bam. And as he practiced those fundamentals of being able to move this, uh, shoot it through this tire at a moving, moving target, guess what he got good at? Throwing the ball at a moving target. It's called fundamentals, right? How do we get good at Christianity? Well, it's through a living relationship with Jesus Christ where he speaks into our lives through the word of God on a regular daily basis and we get the fundamentals of these truths in our lives so we can live them out. Amen? So the first principle in a successful life Christianity-wise in regards to living it out and, and, and staying on track spiritually is be in a place where you can be established in God's truth and you can be reminded of God's truth day in and day out. In church, that's why it's so important what we're doing here at Calvary Chapel. If you come to church here, you're gonna study the entire New Testament on Sunday mornings, every verse, every truth in the New Testament. We're going through Matthew to Revelation, and we need to be established in these things if we're gonna live out our Christianity. And it's also church why it's so important that you have a daily time where you're in God's word, and you get established in the truth of God's word on a daily basis and be reminded of these things. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go on now. After being reminded, Peter says the next principle for being established in truth and living it out and, and being people that stand track spiritually, let's look what it says. For verse, verse six, or let's see, verse 16. For we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what he says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an an utterance as this was made by him, by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, Peter's reminiscing now about an event that happened that's recorded in all three synoptic gospels. Synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this event's called the Transfiguration. And what happened was Peter, James, and John, the three closest disciples of Jesus, were brought up to this mountain. And they walked up this mountain with Jesus. And when they got to the top of the mountain, they got tired from that hike or whatever, and they all fell asleep. And when they woke up on this mountain, all of a sudden they were... they saw the transfigured Lord. Now, the word transfigured, interesting word, metamorpho. Guess what English word we get from that? Metamorphosis. It's that metamorphosis is what's, what's talked about when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and then after a period of time becomes a butterfly. And what it's saying there is when Jesus went up to this mountain, all of a sudden Peter and James and John, when they woke up, Jesus was transfigured, metamorphosed, and he was brought to his glorified state. And Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in his glorified state. Check this out. And, and, and Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah. He was talking about a soon-to-be departure uh, from the earth with Moses and Elijah. And all of a sudden, Peter says, Jesus, Jesus, this is awesome. Let's stay up here. Let's build booths, and we'll build booths for Moses and Elijah so we can have the importance of the law and the prophets, and then we'll build a booth for you. 
Now, that was typical Peter foot and mouth disease because all of a sudden this cloud came and the Father spoke from heaven and said, this, Jesus, is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And what the Father was saying there is, let's not prioritize the law and the prophets anymore. Let's prioritize my Son, Jesus. It's not about the law and the old covenant anymore and the prophets anymore. It's about Jesus and the new covenant of grace. And so Peter here, here's what he's doing. He's recollecting the fact that they're not teaching through the apostles' teaching. They're not teaching just uh, fables and fairy tales. They're not teaching things that were just cleverly devised, he says here, fairy, fables in the King James Version. He says, here's what Peter's saying. We're not making this stuff up. What's he saying? We were eyewitnesses to the majesty of Jesus Christ on that, in that glorified state. And that's important. That's the second thing we need to hang on to if we're going to be people that go the long haul, that don't get off track spiritually. We need to realize that our foundation for what we believe is not a bunch of fairy tales and fables. Our foundation for what we believe is the eyewitness accounts of the apostles of Jesus Christ that witnessed his majesty. That's amazing. And the apostles didn't just witness Jesus' majesty on that Mount of Transfiguration. They witnessed Jesus' majesty when he said, Lazarus, come forth. When he said to Jairus' daughter, little daughter, arise. When he brought all these thousands of people out to the field to, to uh, teach them, they got hungry at the end of the day and he said, hey, Give me those two fish, those loaves of bread, and we're going to feed all 15,000 people with these two fish and these five loaves of bread. Can you imagine that? I, w- I want to see the video of all. I want to get to heaven on that one. Got 15,000 people in a field, and they start just multiplying the bread. They start multiplying the fish, and they feed 15,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread. There are eyewitnesses to the majesty of of Jesus Christ. We need to remember that. We don't follow clearly devised tales or fables. We follow the apostolic teaching that it was, and they were eyewitnesses to the majesty of Jesus Christ. You know, I was reading this week about this, and I was reading Charles Colson actually had a quote in this, and he said this, I'm talking about the, the, the fact that the disciples were also eyewitnesses to the majesty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about that. They saw Jesus Christ buried in a tomb, and three days later, he's resurrected, and he's eating fish with them. And it says this, I know the resurrection is a fact, Charles Colson. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men, Charles Colson says, testifies they had seen Jesus risen from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying that truth. Every one of these 12 men was beaten, tortured, stoned, put in prison. They would not have endured this if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me that the 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And I would say amen to that. Listen to some of the ways these apostles died. I read this about uh, tradition, what tradition tells us about the death of the apostles. It says that Peter died in A.D. 64 to 68 sometime during Nero's persecution of the Christians. He was crucified upside down on a cross in Rome. Andrew was crucified on St. Andrew's cross. The cross had the shape of an X. He was not nailed to the cross, but he was tied to it. It took several days before he died. James, the son of Zebedee, died in A.D. 44 after he was beheaded by King Agrippa. Uh, uh, the uh, beloved apostle John was in exile uh, to the Isle of Patmos before he was released and went to Ephesus where he died. Philip died in Heropolis, Turkey, by, by hanging. Nathaniel, believed that, uh, uh, had ministered in Armenia and was flayed to death with knives in India. Matthew died a martyr's death in Ethiopia. Uh, Thomas, who we call Doubting Thomas, ancient tradition says that Thomas died near uh, Madras, India, in A.D. 70, he was killed with a spear. James the Less, tradition says, was crucified in Lower Egypt and sawed in pieces. 
Thaddeus was martyred in Persia. He died via arrows. Simon the Zealot was crucified as believed that he ministered together with Thaddeus. Now, I'm reading all that to you because here's, here's, here's what you need to understand. Men don't die for a lie. If they made this stuff up, if it was just cleverly devised tales made up by the apostles, the first apostle, when he died, the rest of them would be running to the hills with their tail between their legs saying, we made it up. That's what Charles Colson is saying. But they didn't. They were eyewitnesses to the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they were eyewitnesses all the way to the end. Acts chapter 1 says that at the very end of Jesus' 40 days appearances in his resurrected state, it says that Jesus stepped on a cloud and he ascended to heaven and the angel said as he was ascending to heaven, the same way he left, he will come again. And they saw that. Eyewitnesses of his majesty. And this is important, church. We need to realize that what we believe, the truths we stand on, were not made up. They were verified through apostles that even saw Jesus in his resurrected state for 40 days, according to Acts chapter 1, with many convincing proofs. And I think as we go through our Christian pilgrimage, we need to remember, it's not made up. It has the foundation of apostolic teacher, teachers that died for the truth of what they were teaching throughout the New Testament. Amen? And then it goes on, back to 2 Peter chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 19, great verse. And so we have the prophetic word, made sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day draw, dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, third way that we stay on track spiritually. Well, first, first way going back is being a place where you're reminded of God's truth on a regular basis. Second way is remember that our foundation as apostolic foundation of eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ. The third thing that's important if we're going to stay on track spiritually is to realize that this book is prophetic. And it's prophetic in regards to, it speaks of future events, many of which have already taken place and have been made sure. The prophetic word has been made sure. And so what we believe, again, is not only not cleverly devised tales, but it has the foundation of the prophetic word being made sure. And I like what it says there. There's this prophetic word that we have right here. It's like a lamp shining in a dark place. Interesting. Dark place in the Greek is a murky place. And so we've got a problem as human beings. Our problem is we were created to be in a Garden of Eden, paradise kind of world. But what happened because of sin is our beautiful paradise we were created to be in and exist in has become a dark place. It's become a murky place. When I think of murky, I think of swamp. We're living... Christians, we're living in a swamp right now. We're living in a dark place. And the way that we have light in our lives in this dark place is through this prophetic word. That's why I love the Bible so much. It lights up my life. It's a prophetic word made sure that shines like a lamp in a dark place and brings light into our lives. God's word is a lamp under our feet. And what? A light onto our path. And how do we know the prophetic word is made sure? How do we know that we could stand on the fact that this prophetic word is made sure? Well, let me read a little bit on that, too. I was reading this this week on fulfilled prophecy. It says, unique among all the books ever written in mankind, the Bible accurately foretells specific events in detail. Many years, sometimes centuries, before they occur, approximately, listen to this, approximately 2,500 prophecies appear in the pages of the Bible. About 2,000 of the 2,500 prophecies, of, talking about future events, 2,000 have already been fulfilled to the letter with no errors. That's the prophetic word being made sure. Well, what, what are some of those things that have, that have already been specified and accurately fulfilled in, in, our, in our history? I'll give you just a few of them. Listen, 
300 of these 2,500 prophecies were fulfilled just in the life of Jesus Christ. I'll give you some examples. In approximately 700 BC, <clears throat> the prophet Micah named the tiny village of Bethlehem as the birthplace of the Israel's Messiah, Micah 5.2. The fulfillment of this prophecy in the birth of Christ is one of the most widely known and widely celebrated facts in history. That's saying in 700 BC, 700 years before Christ came, Micah nailed down the fact that Jesus would be born as the Messiah in the city called Bethlehem. Another uh, example, it says in the 5th century BC, in other words, 500 years before Christ's birth, a prophet named Zechariah declared the Messiah would be betrayed for the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver, according to Jewish law, and also that this money would be used to buy a burial ground for Jerusalem's poor foreigners. Bible writers and secular historians both record 30 pieces of silver as a sum paid to Judas Iscariot for betraying Jesus, and they indicate that the money went to purchase a potter's field used, just as predicted, for the burial of poor aliens. That's in Zechariah 11, 12 to 13. Now, this is the one that I really think prophetically really speaks in making the prophetic word made sure. It says, some 400 years before the crucifixion was even invented, both Israel's King David and the prophet Zechariah and the prophet Isaiah describe the Messiah's death in words that perfectly depict that mode of execution of the crucifixion. This is before crucifixion was even invented by the Roman Empire. Further, they said that the body would be pierced and that none of the bones would be broken, contrary to customary procedures in cases of crucifixion. Again, historians and New Testament writers confirm the fulfillment that Jesus of Nazareth died on a Roman cross, and his extraordinary quick death eliminated the need for a usual breaking of bones. A spear was thrust into his side to verify that he was indeed dead. Do you see that? You know what that's saying? The prophetic word was made sure with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ because it was described in detail 700 years before Christ even came on the scene, 400 years before crucifixion was even invented. You go to things like Isaiah 53, and it describes in detail what was going to happen to Jesus Christ on the cross. He was going to be pierced through for our transgressions. He was going to be crushed for our iniquities, and by his whipping by his scourging, we were going to be healed. Written 700 years before Christ even came and was crucified. The prophetic word being made sure like a lamp shining in a dark place. And then the morning star rises in our heart as we're shined into our lives through the prophetic word. It's amazing. I've depended in the last 40 years of walking with the Lord, so much on the God's word lighting up my life so the morning star can continue to arise in my heart. And just like you, I've had my high times spiritually and I've had my low times spiritually. I've had times where I've been on fire for Christ. I've had times where I haven't been. I remember back in my sophomore year in college, my first semester, I was in this University of Illinois with 45,000 students and it was just, I got lost in it. And I'll admit, at this point, back when I was a sophomore in college, for a whole semester, I went back to the darkness. I backslid. And I got the wrong girlfriend. Don't blame on the girlfriend, John. But I did. Got associated with the wrong girlfriend. Got associated with the wrong people. Got pulled back into the world. And I, I was lost for a whole semester. And then at the end of that semester, my fall semester, my sophomore year in college, I went home. And the first thing I did after I got out of that swamp <laughs> I was in was I went to Dr. Dave's Bible study Friday night. And it was like, oh, all of a sudden the lamp of God's word was shining in my life again. And then I, I, I just, I, I, I got myself back into fellowship with other Christians. I went back to Calvary Memorial Bible Church that Sunday, got back into just fellowshipping with Christians in the Word of God. I remember having Christians over my house just about every night that Christmas break, and we were, people, someone would bring a guitar, and other, everybody would bring Bibles, we'd just study the Word together, and it was like God's light just started shining into my life again. And I remember going back after that fall semester, my spring semester, said, that's it. Enough of the backsliding. I'm going to get back to living for Christ. And what I did was I got in every Bible study and every campus ministry I could get involved with. 
I got involved with FCA. I got involved with Baptist Student Union. I got involved with Campus Crusade. I got involved with a campus church called Basic Brothers and Sisters in Christ. And we, I just, I immersed myself in God's word that spring semester of my sophomore year because I was so afraid of, of just getting off track spiritually. You know what happened? I got back on fire for Christ because God's word started shining in my life again and the morning stars started arising in my heart again. And I tell you what, that's what God's word is for. The prophetic word is made sure to be like a lamp shining into our lives so that the morning star can arise in our hearts. So if you get off track spiritually, get back in God's word. Get back in church. Get back under the teaching of God's word. Get back into having those daily times in God's word so the oracles of God could be like a lamp shining into your life. Now let's close it up. Go back to our scripture. After that scripture it says, but we know the, uh, that first of all, verse 20, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But notice, this is the foundation of God's word. But men, what? Moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Here's the last principle I need you to see here. Is that, that again, if we're going to stay on track spiritually, we need to be reminded of these truths over and over again. If we're going to stay on track spiritually, we need to trust that the foundation for what we believe is the apostolic witness, the eyewitnesses of the majesty of Jesus Christ. If we're going to stay on track spiritually, we've got to let the prophetic word be shining into our lives so that we can have the light of God's word in our life. But lastly, if we're going to be staying on track spiritually, we got to believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God that's inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Notice what it says there, that this scripture that we have is not someone's, someone's private interpretation. It's not created by some act of human will. But the foundation for what we believe in God's word is men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke for God prophetically through this word. Interesting, the word moved there, it's like a wind blowing into a sail to get the ship to move. And see, the ship of God's word is moved by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so men spoke by the Spirit and that's what we have, again, as God's word. This book is amazing because, yeah, it's got, it's got 40 different authors, 1,500-year time period that it's written in, and it's written over three different continents. But if you go through this book, it all ties together beautifully. All 66 books are in perfect harmony. You know why? There might be 40 human authors, but there's really only one author. And that author is the Holy Spirit that moved men to write the pages of this book. And we need to understand that. This book is not just a book written by human beings. It's a book that's inspired. Actually, God breathed. That's what it says in 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Or 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says that all scripture is inspired by God. NIV version says, is God breathed. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God breathe. It's a whew. men moved by the Holy Spirit wrote the pages of this book. And don't let anybody ever tell you else anything different. It's inspired by God. It's God breathed. <clears throat> uh, Charlie Campbell, who's spoken for me a number of times from this pulpit. Great guy, I love him, he's an apologetics, probably one of the top guys in the country and I, right, right now, I think, in defending the faith. Amazing, we're going to have him back here sometime, probably in January, we're talking about bringing him and Frank Turek together to do an apologetics Saturday seminar and then have Frank Turek, probably, or Charlie or Frank speak on Sunday mornings. But uh, Charlie Campbell's come up with this acrostic that I like, and it, it talks about the, the, the truth that God's word is inspired, it's spoken by men, but moved by the Holy Spirit. And it, it's, it's faces is what the acrostic is. Let me give it to you. You can write it down if you want to. It says this, the faces that prove the validity of God's word being inspired, inerrant, infallible. F stands for fulfilled prophecy. We've already seen that. Over 2,000 prophecies have been fulfilled because of uh, God's word speaking it 
hundreds of years before it happened. A stands for archaeological verification. It's amazing. If you look at archaeologists, the more they discover, the more it verifies the truth of the history that's in the Word of God, Old Testament, New Testament. A C, consistency internally. I've already said it. The consistency within the 66 books of having 40 different authors writing over a 1,500-year time period over three different continents, and it's perfectly consistent from Genesis to Revelation. It actually has one thread through all 66 books, and that's the plan of redemption. There's a crimson thread. The blood of the sacrifice bringing forgiveness to our sins is from Genesis to Revelation. Consistency internally. E, external verification. What does that mean? It means there's external things that verify the truth of God's word. Can you say Dead Sea Scrolls? There's Dead Sea Scrolls that, were, that, that are proven by secular uh, uh, archaeologists that they're before the time of Christ. The Dead Sea Scrolls are dated 150 B.C., but they are perfectly in line with what we have with the Word of God today. I've been there in Qumran three different times on our trips to Israel, and it's amazing. They have the whole scroll of Isaiah, all 66 chapters of Isaiah that go back to 150 B.C. dated, and every single word and every single chapter is exactly what we have today, word for word, all 66 chapters going back to 150 B.C. That's external verification. And the last thing that proves the validity that this book is inspired, God-breathed, infallible, inerrant, is scientific accuracy. It's amazing. The more science discovers, the more it verifies the truth of what the Bible says. Do you know there's a whole season of human history that, that scientists were saying that the world is flat? And as they were saying the world is flat... The Bible is saying the world was round. There's scriptures that point in the Old Testament to the fact that the, 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 the world is round. And guess what? When Christopher Columbus sailed, he didn't go off the edge of a flat world. And that's what they thought. They were scared to explore places too far in the oceans because this world's flat and you'll go right off the flatness of this world. And science found out differently. And the Bible, again, was verified through the truth of what the Bible says. It's amazing. Over and over again throughout human history, scientists have said something, the Word of God has said something differently, and then as the years and centuries evolve, what happens is scientists realize what the Bible says is scientifically accurate. Faces. Let's go through that one more time. Do you got it? What's faces? Fulfilled prophecy, A, archaeological verification, C, consistency internally, E, external verification, S, scientific accuracy. Amen? So what we believe, what do we believe? We believe that the Word of God is not a book just written by men. Men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And we believe that it's okay to be reminded over and over again of the truths of this book because that will establish us in truth. And what do we believe? We believe also that this book is a book that is so powerful because it's like a lamp that shines in the dark places of our lives so that the morning star can arise in our hearts. And what do we believe? We believe that this isn't fables or fairy tales. It's men, again, there were eyewitnesses to the majesty of Jesus Christ wrote the pages of this book. I don't know about you, but I love God's word. And I love the fact that as a church, we're staying on track spiritually because we're sticking with the book. And we're going to be a church until Jesus comes that's going to allow this book to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And Christians, when you start feeling like you're getting derailed, I encourage you, get back in the book. Get back in a place where you can hear God's word taught. Get back in a, a place where on a daily basis you're allowing God's word to just shine in your lives. It'll keep you, keep you on track spiritually. Amen?